Welcome to EET 3329C Communication Systems course at Valencia College for the fall semester of 2020. This is your instructor, Dr. Wilfredo Rivas Torres, and we will now talk about uh, do our lecture number four, part two, which uh, we've been discussing analog modulation and demodulation. The specific topics for today is, are going to be nonlinear modulation, also known as angle modulation. We'll talk about the bandwidth of the signals, um, how to generate both the FM and PM waveforms, how to demodulate FM and PM, uh, some effects of nonlinear distortion, and we'll talk about the superheterodyne AM and FM receiver. So we know from our discussion and the first part of this lecture that in AM signals, the amplitude of the carrier is what actually carries the information. That's where the information contact resides in an amplitude modulated signal. Now, there's two other parameters for the carrier, namely the frequency and the phase. We can also vary those linearly with respect to the message signal of interest. So let's go ahead and describe the essence of both FM and PM modulation. So here's an interesting concept. It's called instantaneous frequency. So FM signals can vary the instantaneous frequency in proportion to our um, modulating signal or information signal, M of T. What that means is that the carrier frequency is changing continuously at every instant of time. Um, now, when we were measure uh, frequency, we always look at a, one period of the signal, right? You look at the period of the signal, one over that, that gives you your frequency. That's what we, we've all learned, right? But this is a signal, this FM signal is constantly changing the frequency. Uh, how can that make sense, right? Because how, how do you define a period now? Because actually, even within inside one period, quote unquote, of the signal, the frequency is changing. So you really don't have a concept of a period anymore. Or so it seems, right? So um, let us start by generalizing what a sinusoidal signal really is kind of is, right? So we have a signal, let's call it phi of t, is going to be equal to a, the amplitude, times cosine of some kind of a phase, right? And uh, this theta of t is what we call the generalized angle, which is a function of, of time. Now, to sort of try to understand uh, what instantaneous frequency means, Let's look at what a uh, general uh, theta of t, that's our generalized phase, would look like. Okay, so on this uh, graph, this dark line, this wavy dark line, is our generalized phase, right? Now, the conventional way that we looked at sinusoids is a cosine omega ct plus um theta zero, which is a constant, right? This theta is a constant, it doesn't move with time. Now, if we look at that phase, is what's inside the parentheses here, is omega ct time plus our constant, right? So this is a line on this, on this uh, graph. This is a line, right? Where omega c is the slope, and the y-intercept point is our theta zero. So that's this line, right? Okay. So notice that we went through the exercise on making sure that this line touches uh, the generalized phase at exactly one point, right? So that, let's call this point, it happens at time t, right? So um, the book goes on to say, okay, if you have a, a certain range, t1 to t2, and you have delta t, and as delta t goes, to zero, right, uh, you end up back to the equation with your generalized phase, right? 
and your um, and the conventional um, sinusoid are identical at this one point, right? And that means that this line is tangential, right? The line, the, our straight line from our conventional uh, sinusoidal waveform is tangential at that point. That means that at that point, right, they're, they're both equal, right? Um, we can generalize this to the overall concept. And, and honestly, if you think about this, we're, we're actually talking about a derivative, right? Because that's, if you go back to your first calculus class and they start talking about the derivative, they do the limit as delta t goes to zero, and they come up, they, they come up with a derivative. So if we want to know what the slope of this curly, uh, wiggly curve is over all t, what we need to do is do the derivative, right? So the instantaneous frequency now begins to make some sense because it's nothing but the derivative of that generalized phase that we were talking about, okay? And if you know the frequency, you can always determine what the generalized phase is because it's nothing but the integral from minus infinity to t, and we have to define some kind of dummy variable, which in our case here is alpha, right? You guys hopefully remember all that from your old calculus, calculus days, right? So any modulation where we where the angle of the carriers vary, that's what we call angular modulation or exponential modulation. Angle modulation being the more general term. Okay. Uh, and there's always two possibilities, right? Uh, we just talked about the frequency and the phase. So you have both this is where both PM and FM uh, come from. So let's talk more specifically about phase modulation, right? So for phase modulation, we're going to have that uh, our generalized phase is going to be omega ct plus some constant phase or initial phase plus this parameter kpl. I'll, I'll talk about kpl a little bit more in a little while. Times our information signal, right? Kp is a constant. And obviously, omega c is our carrier frequency. Now, we can't, for the rest of our discussion, I'm just going to make the, uh, the assumption that uh, the constant phase or initial phase is zero. And we can do that without any loss of generality. So we'll, we'll normally talk about omega ct plus k, kp times m of t. Okay. So um, when we do that, the resulting pm wave takes on this form. Right, where this is the the conventional AM, the uh, sinusoidal waveform. Sorry, not AM, sinusoidal waveform. Um, and notice that the phase now is KP times our information signal. So now the phase of the signal varies linearly with our information. Okay. If you want to know what the instantaneous frequency of this um, waveform is, Right, we're looking for W i of t. W i of t, you have to do the derivative of the phase. This whole term here inside the square bracket is what the phase is. That's a generalized phase. And when you do the uh, the derivative, you end up with omega c. Remember, kp is a constant, so it's whatever the derivative of your information signal is. Okay. And notice again that now here. And PM, the frequency varies linearly, but it's with a derivative, okay? The derivative of the modulating signal, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit more in detail about frequency modulation. So we want to vary the uh, frequency linearly with our modulating signal. That would generate FM, or frequency modulation, right? So we ex actually want our W sub i to equal omega c plus kf, where again, kf is another constant, times our information, right? Um, turns out that now the angle, right, the angle of our signal en ends up being the integral of omega c, our, our instantaneous frequency. And again, we put the dummy uh, variable alpha here, 
Um, so it ends up being that the phase is omega ct plus kf um, and the integral of our information signal from minus infinity to t. Why did we uh, go through all this pain of, of saying this? Because again, this is a generalized phase. So for the FM waveform, looking at it as our conventional um, sinusoid, omega ct, and then this is the term for the phase. It, uh, initially, it kind of looks, uh, just come out, I'll come out and say it, it kind of looks ugly, but this is not as hard or, or as bad as it looks. It just does not have a, a, a nice, clean sort of uh, equation to it, but it's not difficult, uh, and we're, we're not going to be evaluating this integral at all. Okay. All right. Um, one more thing. Uh, we talked about KF. Uh, our textbook doesn't call it this, but um, I'm going to. This is typically what we call it. We call this the frequency sensitivity factor, and it has units of hertz per volt, right? And it, it and it should come out, make some sense to you guys, um, because KF. Right. This this all has this equation has to result in her in well it will be radians per right so um, uh, radians per volt in this case because it's all in terms of omega but if I divide this by two i you guys can see where kf ends up in being in hertz per volts right sorry I kind of skipped the the definition of kp so let me get back to it. So when we're talking about, uh, about PM modulation, KP is also known as the phase sensitivity factor, and that you know has either units of degrees per volt or radians per volt. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and do uh, uh, an example. Discuss this example from the textbook. So what we want to do is we we have a uh, I want to sketch the FM and PM waveforms for an MOT signal that looks like this, which is this triangle waveform. Okay. Um, we're going to have a frequency and phase sensitivity factors of 2 pi times 10 to the 5 and 10 pi, respectively. And let's make an assumption that F of C, our carrier frequency, is 100 megahertz. Okay. So we know for that for FM, this is our instantaneous frequency. Now, normally we like to talk in terms of frequency, uh, we, this radians, radians per, per second, we normally don't talk about that too much, uh, even though it looks really nice in the equations as I explained earlier in like lecture number two. Uh, this is really what the instantaneous frequency looks like. So it's FFI, the, the instantaneous frequency will be the frequency of the carrier plus kf over 2 pi, right, uh, m of t, because uh, our author likes to define kff all the time in radians per volt, okay, and kp, the same thing in um, radians per volt, okay. Um, so if we do that, right, um, if you do that, uh, you end up with FSC 10 to the 8, that's 100 megahertz, plus KF divided by 2 pi. Well, it was 2 pi times 10 to the 5, so it ends up being 10 to the 5 in this case, M of T. Now, here's an interesting thing. How how do I know what are my minimum and maximum frequencies? Okay, What you do is you look at your information signal, whatever is the minimum signal or the maximum signal that determines your minimum frequency and your maximum frequency in your FM waveform. Now, it's kind of easy here to see, right? Because we have a nice symmetric uh, signal around the horizontal axis or the time axis, right? That's not always the case in the real world, right? So it's a, it's a little uh, difficult just looking at a waveform to always tell that, unless you can clearly see, okay, here, here's the maximum, here's the minimum, right? Uh, but by design, you would know uh, that you would not allow the signal to be any more than a certain range. So th th those values are, will always be bounded. 
Okay, so and if you run the numbers, you'll see that at the minimum of your information signal, uh, an FM, your frequency is going to be 100.1 megahertz. Uh, excuse me, 101 is the maximum, and 99.9 .9 is the minimum. Okay, and um, so the signal. Let, let's watch. This is the FM waveform, right? So the signal is increasing, and what you see is the where the signal crosses zero, that range starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller because the frequency continues to increase. Up to a certain point where it reaches the maximum, then the, the signal frequency begins to decrease again. And it, it's minimum at the minimum point. And then it goes back and increases and decreases, increases and decreases in frequency to follow our, module, uh, our information signal. Now for PM, before we get too far, for PM, we know we're gonna need the derivative of uh, our information signal. Now, the author picked a really nice waveform, this triangular waveform, because we know that the derivative of a straight line is its slope. So when it's going up, it's a straight line, and the slope of that is 20,000, right? And then when it's coming down, it's the same slope, but then it's negative, so that's where it's minus 20,000. It almost looks like a binary waveform at this point. Right? When the derivative in this case it really is. And then if you go ahead and calculate the frequencies, it turns out that uh, because of the numbers that the author selected for KP, it turns out that you have the same maximum and minimum frequency. It's just that in the case of PM, right? The case of PM, uh, we, we're going to have a constant phase or um, a constant derivative. So therefore, for the part where information signal is going up, the phase stays, the frequency stays constant. And then when the signal comes down, the, the waveform uh, frequency stays constant, right? And it seems like we're going between two frequencies. Now, in true honesty, what's happening here, the phase is increasing, increasing, increasing. And then when you switch frequencies, then um, you're going a lot slower. So your cumulative phase is decreasing, actually. Okay? And then increases and decreases and increases. And increases. That's what it, what's going on with the PM waveform. Okay? It's a lot harder to see uh, how the PM waveform relates to the information signal, but you have to think about it in terms of phase. All right. One uh, important aspect of these angle modulated waveforms is that they have a constant amplitude. So amplitude A remains constant. Notice the waveform, phi of FM and phi of PM. The magnitude of the carrier stays constant, right? So the output power of an angle modulated waveform, be it PM or FM, is always going to be A squared over 2, right, or proportional to that. It doesn't matter what KP or KF are. It's always going to be a constant amplitude. All right. We've always talked about bandwidth. If you go back to the AM waveform, right, the classical AM waveform, or double sideband suppressed carrier. You remember that we said that the bandwidth was two times B, where B is the information uh, bandwidth uh, on a baseband, right? Um, now we have these signals that are changing frequency. So how are we gonna, even going to determine what the bandwidth is? All right. So. Um, we already talked about that the FM deviation from the frequency of the carrier is going to be KF times MT. Now, how much total deviation or what's the maximum deviation that you can have, uh, or we'll call it delta omega, um, and eventually we'll call it delta F as in this equation here, which I'll talk about in just a second, is plus or minus KF times MP. Now, let's go back to the example. This is kind of an interesting thing. So if I say that this is minus MP, the minimum value, and this is uh, plus MP, you can see that MP actually has a value of one, right? 
because it's the absolute maximum value. If this signal was DC shifted uh, negatively, right? Let's say 0.5 and minus 1.5, MP would be 1.5, right? That that's what we would typically use. Okay. So that gives you how, how much delta F. So a, a more general way to look at it is actually you would say delta F is KF, the maximum value minus the minimum value. That way we cover the whole range and we make sure be the signal uh, shape is that way, be that DC shifted or anything. This is the total peak frequency deviation. That's the maximum delta F that you can have in your FM waveform. Now that we've defined that, we can actually estimate the bandwidth, and the bandwidth of FM is two times the peak deviation plus the bandwidth of our baseband. Times you got those two times at those two values and multiply it by two, and that will be the bandwidth, right, of your FM signal. Um, this is known as Carson's rule, and you'll hear everywhere. And anybody that talks about how much bandwidth you have in your FM signal. They always will refer to Carson's rule. He's the one who came up with this expression. Um, a little bit about uh, our textbook. Our textbook actually goes into a lot of the details. And, and for sake of time, I did not go into all those details. So pardon to those who uh, um, wanted all the technical details and all the derivations. Um, I did do some hand waving here. Um, but if you go to the textbook, I believe um, section 4.6, I uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of, this, uh, of the section right now, but um, it's, it's in the book. Now the book explains it in um, a really nice flow of uh, in explaining it. I've seen it explained like that, and I've also seen it explained in terms of talking about Bessel functions and uh, different spectral components, and both explanations are valid and reach the same conclusion, and then they both end up with Carson's rule. Okay, so we kind of jumped a, a whole bunch of material, uh, but this is uh, the essence of that, and I kind of feel good about doing it this way. Um, there are people who like to talk about this deviation ratio beta which is nothing more than delta F over B, and it can be a, a figure of merit for an FM system. Uh, however, not too many people talk about it, okay? But um, you can also use Carson's rule once you know what the deviation ratio is, right? And it's nothing but delta F, the peak frequency deviation over the modulation bandwidth, uh, right? And um, you can express Carson rules as two times B uh, beta plus one, right? Um, it, this beta, some people sort of equate it to the modulation index and in AM. And indeed, if you were doing tone modulated FM, uh, you can, it, beta is called the modulation index in that case, right? And many people talk, call it modulation index, FM modulation index, but it's not 100% correct in the same sense that it was in or, I, yeah, it's not exactly the same modulation in this as it was in FM, okay? All right, so let's talk about the modulation for a PM waveform. It turns out if you follow the logic, it, the, the, you end up with Carson's rule. All the results from FM apply directly, right? We, we look at the uh, instantaneous frequency. We can define a peak frequency deviation. It's just that it's in terms of the derivative, you have to look at the deri maximum of the derivative, the minimum of the derivative, and it's Kp divided uh, times the, that delta over 4 pi. That gives you your peak frequency deviation for PM. And it turns out that, uh, like, like I said, Carson rules applies again. And we can, again, talk about that, the same deviation ratio beta. Okay. All right, let's do a quick example. So um, same waveform as a prior example, right? And uh, same KF and KP. Um, and they want us to estimate the bandwidth. Now, the author goes through for um, for FM. They go through this thing where they, they, they talk about um, the Fourier transform, 
of this waveform because they want you to only consider uh, the essential bandwidth of M of T or the bandwidth up to the third harmonic. Um, I, I find that explanation a little too much. Um, it, this is so, as simple as saying what's the 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 fundamental frequency of this triangular waveform, and they tell you what the period is: two times ten to the minus four, right? Or or two hundred microseconds. So if I want to know what the fundamental frequency is, I just do one over that period, which is one over two times 10 to the minus 4 turns out to be five, a 5 kilohertz triangular waveform, right? So it re, it's periodic and its frequency is 5 kilohertz. What is the third harmonic uh, for the bandwidth? bandwidth? That's stated by the problem, right? Up to its third harmonic uh, is B equals 3FO, and that turns out to be uh, 15 kilohertz. Now, the reason the authors did do the Fourier series is try to convince you that this is the right number, right? And they do it in terms of explaining how much the third uh, uh, harmonic is down, and then they tell you that, hey, by the time you get to the to the uh, fifth harmonic, you're only at 0.16 power, right? So you're not really throwing away much information or much, or much power in this case by only considering the bandwidth of the third harmonic, okay? Again, it's a little, it's a little more detail um, that I, uh, I would expect uh, my students in my class to do if this were a, a problem that they have to solve. Okay. Now, with armed with that information, um, the rest is just to apply um, Carson's rule. Now, uh, because we know of a specific MP for our signal, right? We know MP is one you can actually calculate delta f it's the same definition it's just uh, because we can make the assumption that um, mp is one uh, you just took one over two pi kf times mp and that's your delta f right this works for nice periodic signals right but i gave you guys the generalized uh, uh, equation for peak frequency deviation you normally would want to use that one um, so the bandwidth ends up being 230 kilohertz. You could have done it with a uh, with a deviation ratio, and then you obviously have to reach the same number of 230 kilohertz. Uh, quite interesting, right? In AM, right? In AM, if we had done this, we know that the bandwidth uh, of our AM signal, right? If the baseband or modulation information is 5 kilohertz, then our AM signal has a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz, right? Oh, this one has so much higher bandwidth. Well, that's a little misleading because it depends on the value of KF, right? So don't jump to the conclusion, oh, uh, FM is uh, not as efficient bandwidth-wise as AM. That's not necessarily true. It depends on the value of your uh, both the frequency sensitivity factors or your phase sensitivity factor as well. And um, we also do the PM. Now, for PM, remember, uh, we're looking at the derivative. So our MP this time is 20,000, right? And then um, if you do, again, the, the, equa the simple equation, you end up with a delta F of 50 kilohertz. And a total bandwidth for PM turned out to be 130 kilohertz in this case, OK? Um, the problem also says, what if you double the amplitude of M of, M of T? And if you go through the exercise of doing that, right, MP now is twice what it was before, both uh, MP and the derivative, actually. They're both the double. And when you run the numbers, you'll see that uh, they're roughly double of what they were before. Okay. So doubling the amplitude or the value of M of P uh, doubles the uh, the roughly doubles the, the frequency, okay? But not exactly, right? Okay, so um, what's left to talk about for FM and, and, and PM is to talk about how, how we demodulate them. Uh, and remember, these two are, are related, so the modulation process is actually quite similar for both of them. Um, we know what the instantaneous frequency is. Now, if uh, 
again, the book explains this in a little bit more detail than I'm doing here. But if we had a frequency selective network with a transfer function that looks like 2a pi f plus some constant b, right? Again, we can sort of assume b is zero and no loss of generality. Um, we could actually do this, right? So, so what we're saying is if I have omega versus voltage and I have a linear section, right? I can actually figure out uh, what M of T is, right? Because I, I have all the information I need, right? Uh, the, the, the slope is um, KFF. I know what uh, the omega C is the offset, right? Or the middle of this. And then everything else, WI is actually this straight line. And I can actually do this, right? It, it shouldn't be that difficult, right? If you remember back to, uh, to Fourier transform, we said that a transfer function of J to pi F, um, what kind of circuit has that? Uh, it will be a differentiator, right? So whenever you have a differentiator or the derivative, right? If you have a derivative of M or any function of t, it results in a free transfer j to pi f, which is actually kind of what we're looking for, right? So essentially, what I'm saying is, if we if we apply f to the your um, fm signal phi of fm to an ideal differentiator, you end up with something that looks like this, right? This is a derivative, and you end up with something that that looks like that has this form, okay? Now, notice that both the amplitude and the frequency of the derivative of the FM signal will vary now, right? So now you have an envelope that actually turns out to be um, some constant A multiplied by omega C K F M of T. That's what's in this envelope, right? So that's the signal after the, the remember, after the, the differentiator, you end up with this waveform. Interesting, right? Um, now, this only happens if the amplitude A coming in, the original FM signal, is still constant. Remember, it should be constant. There's things that could cause that not to be constant, right? There's such factor as channel noise and fading that we've locked, talked about before. That can cause A to vary. So whatever happens, you want to make sure that whatever FM goes into this demodulation process has a constant amplitude. Otherwise, you have the, uh, an amplitude here that's distorted. Okay. Um, then after that, right, once you have the right amplitude, right, we can actually do what we did with AM. All you need is an envelope detector. And once you get an envelope detector, you recuperate your signal M of T. Isn't that so that's uh, kind of a really nice result, right? We can demodulate both AM and FM. Uh, you have to do an extra step with FM and PM, right? You need this differentiator circuit, but still, um, the, uh, the envelope circuit, all the stuff that we talked about, kind of is, is applicable. Um, so the differentiator circuit is not sort of uh, like the only way. And by the way, a differentiator circuit you can create with an like an operational amplifier, right? Um, you can also, uh, but you can also replace that with a linear system. Um, it just has to have a place where it has a positive slope, right? And it turns out that um, the high pass RC filter, like the one here. Right, where you have the capacitor in series with the incoming signal and a shunt resistor, that can actually take on the role of your differentiator circuit because this is the transfer function, right? It's J to pi FRC. You already see there's a J to pi uh, uh, RC there. Now, if you make two pi RC much much less than one. That means that this denominator becomes one and the approximate transfer function of this whole thing becomes J two pi FRC. That's the J two pi, uh, that thing that we've been looking for, right? So for this part where that transfer function is linear, we can use it as our differentiator circuit. 
you can demodulate FM signals with that. It's fairly, uh, fairly simple. Um, in, in actuality, the, the bandwidth sometimes is just not there. And it's kind of not always obvious how you get this uh, less than one, right? Um, more uh, digital kinds of uh, FM uh, the modulator, or demodulators, or just sometimes they call them discriminators, is to use zero crossing detectors because those you can actually do in digital circuits, right? Uh, and essentially, it's like doing a frequency count. So what you're doing is you are determining what the actual frequency is all the time. Once you know the frequency, the instantaneous frequency, I should say, um, you know um, then what the and well, you, ha you have to know the instantaneous frequency. You know you need to know your sensitivity factor, and with those two, it's it's an easy thing to to determine what the uh, M of T signal or measure signal is, right? And remember, you're doing this all, all in the digital domain. So therefore, you, all you need is a fast processor to do, be able to do that. OK, here's a special topic. Um, uh, again, um, we're, we're talking about this uh, heterodyne receivers at a high level. So again, I wouldn't be uh, testing my students on this. But it's important that you, you kind of guys understand how these receivers work, especially in things like broadcast, and actually your cell phone does this too, okay? So this, a frequency mixer, um, and sometimes uh, when you take this uh, circuit that's called a mixer, uh, and you put it along with filters and amplifiers, people like to call them frequency converters in general, okay? So, um, in this talk, I'll, uh, I'll sort of interchangeably talk about frequency converter mixers. Uh, but note that in, in the strict terms, they're not really the same thing. The frequency converter is, uh, you know, a, a bigger system and includes more components, right? Like amplifiers, filters, and, and other stuff. All right. So the whole idea here, and by the way, this is not for this is for both AM and FM and PM, right? It, this is not specifically to, to any type of modulation. It, it applies to all of them. Um, what we're what what a mixer or frequency converter does is it takes any frequency that comes at the input and it transforms it into another frequency that we call the intermediate frequency or the IF frequency, and we'll denote it by omega sub i. How do we get to this frequency? Well, we're going to multiply our incoming carrier. Let's say it's AM. For this example, we're using AM again, BFM. Uh, and we're multiplied by two cosine of a frequency omega mix, right? Where omega mix is that in a intermediate frequency plus the carrier, or it could be the, the carrier minus the intermediate frequency. Either you add them or you subtract them, right? And after that, we're actually going to put a bandpass filter at omega i. Remember, x of t here is at that omega i frequency, right? So anything else that results here is going to be filtered out. And let's talk about what that is, right? So if I do this product, right, you end up with some expression, right, when you multiply by uh, omega mix. Um, and it turns out that... Uh, Whenever you do this mixer, depending on, if, even if you're summing or you're subtracting, it doesn't matter. You always end up with two products. You end up with the, the sum and the difference, okay, of omega mix, okay? And the same thing with, uh, 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 again, the, the difference or the, or, or, or the addition. Now, if we had selected the um, LO, this other frequency that we're going to inject into our frequency converter or into our mixer, right? If we select the difference of W, w mix as WC minus WI, that means that we are going to end up with a frequency, uh, some frequency component that is omega I plus 2 omega C minus omega I. Or if you select the other one, you end up with uh, omega mix of WC plus WI, then you end up with a, with a plus sign of the two omega C plus WI. Okay? 
Um, in either case, you want omega c minus omega i to be greater than the bandwidth of your i times the bandwidth of the formation signal, and you also want omega uh, or the IF frequency also to be bigger than the bandwidth of your information frequency. Same restrictions that we've always have put on the carrier, right? Carrier always has to be at a greater frequency than an information frequency. So essentially what we're doing here is we're translating from one carrier to the uh, another carrier. And in a little bit, we'll see why we want to do that, OK? So essentially, we're handing off the information from one carrier to the other. Now, it turns out that when you, whenever you do mixing, you end up with a whole bunch of other frequency components that you don't want. Um, the way that's and that's the function of this bandpass filter, right? Is to get rid of all this other stuff that we don't want. Okay, you just want to keep that. So it's going to be centered around your IF frequency. All right. So the real benefit of having um, a heterodyne receiver, right, or super heterodyne receiver. Um, by the way, let me make the, the, the distinction. A heterodyne receiver usually is just one frequency translation. So we go into one IF. The super heterodyne is usually you have two or more, right? Um, and again, and there's reasons for that. Um, I see more and more in nowadays, especially as we go to digital, a lot of people like to work at with heterodyne receivers. That way you only have to worry about one, one, one alone or one oscillator to drive your mixer, OK? So the whole idea here is that no matter what the frequency of your station, let's say this, uh, we're talking about AM stations, right? TV stations, FM radio, it doesn't matter. Uh, remember frequency division multiplexing, FDM? They're all at different frequencies. So whenever you tune to a station, what you're really doing, you're doing two things. You're going to the this, to this RF amplifier, whatever's in front of our converter, and you are tuning that to a certain frequency. So the filters and the amplifiers, they all let go only let go through only the one station that you're interested. That one ch channel of frequencies, right? And that also changes this this LO frequency. So these two are controlled together, so that you always have the same intermediate frequency here. Now, why in the world would I do that? Because if I don't do that, that means I would need, if I want to listen to 10 stations, I would need 10 receivers, one for each station. So instead of doing that, what we do is we just have this knob, if you will, right? You have this one joint knob that controls both the, we call this the front end, right? So the front end amplifiers and filters and your local oscillator and they all result in an IF frequency that's common to all stations, if you will. And that way, this part is only, you can do everything with just one receiver. And whenever you're interfacing, let's say it's a radio to the speaker, or if it's to your, um, to your TV where you're interfacing both to, um, you know, to the, to, the, to the image portion of your TV, now that everything, I was going to say to your tube, but <laughs> everything today is digital, so it's really not your tube. Uh, to, to, um, yeah, to, to the monitor or the, or, or the image of your TV and to the speakers, all that circuit, you only need one of those, right? And actually, you only need one receiver altogether, right? So that's a real advantage of going to this constant uh, IF or intermediate frequency, okay? All right, that's it for our lecture today. I, I will see you guys next time.